Thank you very much. Uh, as he said, my name is Matthew Webb. I am the creator and owner of Planetfall. I am a software engineer and I am a software engineer and simulations designer by trade, and I took that knowledge and that interest and went into my hobby, live action, to try to learn and try to experiment in how we can use computers, mobile technology, and electronics in our hobby. Um, the most important thing I learned in speaking both my own experimentation and speaking to people around the world about how they're using technology is that the potential is definitely here for this with some caveats. Mobile computing has never been any more prevalent than it is now. There is more computing power in this room, I can guarantee, that was then was in an entire office building 20 years ago. And all of you are comfortable and familiar with the interfaces involved with them. That's an unprecedented level of just <coughs> ease of use and comfort with use of technology. If I make a game that uses mobile technology, I can be guaranteed that the majority of my players at least know how to turn it on. That wasn't true 10 years ago. In my talk, these gentlemen have a lot to say about specific instances, and I'll talk about my own specific game. But I mainly want to share with you the things, as I have spoken and sought out a lot of input, I've seen a lot of different ways people have started using technology in live action games. And there's a lot of different strategies for implementing it. There's a lot of different pitfalls for implementing it. So I want to give you guys a toolkit and a view of how you can use it and what are the risks involved and the various levels of commitment you have to use technology. So there are a few basic approaches to technology, about six levels of approaches that you can go to. Roughly an increasing order of how much of a pain in the ass they are. The first one, the lowest one, is the pure prop. This is a device which is, and I, I'm, I would have put it on here, I only heard this term this week, but it's so wonderful, is something that, produ that produces in the LARP environment what they call technical melodrama. <laughs> which is, this thing looks like it's doing something complicated. It gives the impression of being a complex system. But what it is, is nothing but a problem. Over here, uh, I've seen this used in many games, from like X-Files style games to sci-fi games, where there's a lot of variations on a app on a computer, which can, looks like a tricorder, and it pumps out garbage data, and you can press the buttons and make some noise. This is a great prop, it's usually downloadable for free, and I've seen a lot of people do it. This is one of my favorites, it's called Hacker Typer. <laughs> so people might be familiar with it. Literally, you just pound on the keyboard, and it makes it look like you're in some CSI scene. And it actually just dumps a bunch of code, I believe, from a Linux kernel. But it makes you look like you're doing something. Um, these are very accessible things, if they're appropriate for the genre you're doing. And while they seem like they're fruitless, what they're really doing is they're giving a player something to engage with. I know we've all seen people who, they're being told they have to wait five minutes and pound out a piece of armor to fix it. But they actually get really engaged with their hands doing that kind of play acting. This is an electronic version of that, and it's a very accessible, and there's a lot of tools for it. Less interactive are things like, there's literally a script in Linux called Hollywood, which splits up the screen and runs a bunch of scripts that are either default or defined for you. And all they do is spit out garbage. One of them even does the matrix scene. It's a fantastic thing. If you fill up a room with this, it looks like mission control. Very simple implementation. Probably someone could get it done in about two hours. The other variation is uh, the next slightly more complicated introduction of, tech, of electronics and technology is manually controlled effects. This is a fantastic game that was run in a bunker in the Czech Republic called Shards. That's the Czech name. I will not attempt to pronounce it. And they had a complicated communication system where you prompted the controller to contact a particular alien race. All this was, though, is in the background, they switched on monitors, they had a green screen system, they had fantastic costuming. It looked like it was a computer doing something very complicated. 
but it was effectively a lie. It was a manually controlled effect that had a cast member controlling it. This is a very easy way of creating the impression of a complicated electronic system that the players can interact with. The obvious downside is, is basically your programming is a cast member. That means the cast member needs to be trained. This is a gentleman who knew how to, obviously was an AV expert. They had a lot of work that went into sound and audio visual work beforehand. But it also means that this thing can adapt on the fly, and you can just walk in and tell this person what you want to have happen. You can shut down the system just by telling the person to change the setup. So this is very adaptable. It has a little bit more than just a pure prop going on with it. And it requires often a great deal of technical knowledge to set up, but it doesn't require any development time. The next level up when you're actually getting into what we would traditionally call programming is single purpose technology. Usually a single puzzle is the most uh, frequent one, or something which is just used for one thing. In this particular example at my own game, Planetfall, uh, one of our biologists, Tyler, is using a very simple kind of 3, uh, 3D Minesweeper sort of game. And it's meant as a mini game in which to analyze an alien bacteria, where you tap at it and it represents that you're trying to decode it. You know, it's a proxy for that. That particular program was simply stolen off the web and we described what we were doing with it. And then it produced a message at the end of it. This was from Fallout Nothing Personal 2009, which was a Russian Fallout art. They had a microcontroller hooked up to a keypad, to some sort of force field barrier. And if you typed in the right code, which was revealed through plot, the thing destroyed itself dramatically. Very simple effect, very satisfying. This is probably very easy to set up in two or three days. But it does involve an actual software developer, someone who's familiar with microcontrollers and that. This was similarly just, we went and we basically took somebody's work with their permission and used it. The next level up is, I just refer to as smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors is, it is a fully automated system. It seems extremely complicated, but it's actually extremely shallow. Smoke and mirror systems are usually driven by brute force. In this particular example, which is also from Shards, this takes the form of a complicated satellite recon system, which is basically what hides information and interesting pieces of uh, resources and claims to resources in the sci-fi world. And it seems like this complicated scanning system with all this game logic in it. It's not. It's a series of HTML pages they mass produce by brute force. And all it does is that if you type in the right code, it takes you to that web page. It's, it is played up to be a very complicated system. They made it look like it was complicated. In reality, it's extremely shallow. This can be extremely effective, especially if you have limited software engineering technology, or software engineering talent. Aboard. If you have access to a simple <coughs> system, it will run anywhere, but you brute force it. And often this is something that you can kind of hand off to an auxiliary force in order to get done. Then here's the hard part. The dream has been, and has been for a very long time, to hand over complete systems or the entire game to a computer, similar to a video game, where the GM is completely removed, there is no manual effects, and you can get rid of everything. Planetfall has been a mostly successful experiment, at least trying to get there. In a complete systems, as opposed to fully augmented, you have handed over key parts of the entire gameplay to a computer which is faithfully and correctly imposing rules on that system. One example of a complete systems game that's currently going on is there's a game called Spite in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> It is a cyberpunk sci-fi combat game. Their entire banking and hacking system is handled by a server on their site. There's terminals around the play site. The GMs almost never have to touch them, except for to cause their own trouble. Completely automated. It is an enriching part of the game. They never have to touch it or worry about it, except for, of course, when things go terribly wrong. 
Platform takes it a little bit of a step further where we have handed over a majority of the mechanics to a mobile application. Sharing of information, production of resources, we do not have an ops. We do not have anyone you have to talk to in order to make things or gain information. We do not have item cards. We do not have cards attached to something other than two QR codes. And we can regulate and control the flow of information based on the character doing the scan. Character sheets and character creation is completely online. And it's integrated. You log on to the app, it downloads your character and is immediately available. For the most part, I have to do nothing as far as the mechanics of the game. It's all set. This, this has been a two-year project and it's still not complete. And that's why I'm going to talk about why that is. And if you're going to start getting into this idea, because people look at this and say, oh, computers can do anything. I've played video games for years. Look at every indie project, no matter how well-funded and how well-done, within the indie gaming space. How long was Minecraft under development? And that was millions of dollars. How long, how long is Star Citizen? <laughs> um, so things that seem simple, you fight, it's like, it's like trench warfare and software development, you fight for inches. And we'll talk about that. But the dream is, is that we'll have fully automated gameplay. However, <laughs> I'm going to talk about this for a second. Uh, most people, when they talk about augmented gameplay, this is where they start, and it is the biggest mistake ever. Augmented combat is the, I will officially, I will take a position here, I'm sure it's debatable, it is the white whale of live action gaming. It will not be available in a way that is acceptable and that is fun for years. If we're talking about standard physical combat as opposed to just resolution. Um, there's reasons for this. Reality is a very messy problem space. Extremely messy. And in order for a augmented combat system to be acceptable to a player, it cannot screw them over. It must feel real. And professional, multi-million dollar systems developed by other fields have failed to do this consistently and are slightly despised by the professionals who have to use them. Um, they, do an ex they do an extremely good job considering the problem space. And I work for a company who makes one of these systems. But I will admit that they are clunky they have problems. They're better than having to do a live fire exercise. And they're an excellent compromise when you're talking about military simulations. Uh, when you're talking about the classic Top Gun, I have tone thing where you have massive, easily recognizable pieces of equipment in a very simple area, such as in the sky, they work well. The moment you strap it to a person, they start falling apart. You have issues where I, someone throws a smoke grenade and suddenly I open up with, with grenade launchers and no one gets killed. And just weirdness occurs. And these are multi-million dollar systems that they spend a lot of money developing and have been improving for 30 years. Often the problems with them are, as I listed here, they are either expensive, they are almost always expensive if they want to do even start doing their job. The Miles Combat System is the standard for laser combat and military simulations. This is exactly the one where you open up grenade launchers and nothing happens in particular situations. It is two to three thousand dollars per person for those setups. That is not including the gun. Their equipment attaches to a real rifle and reacts to you firing a blank. They are often limited. Uh, for instance, Sabertron, blood them to death, it is a bad product. I have used the system. It is a bad product for live action. It is a good toy. You have to sync up with a particular person and literally you can get hits just by hitting the ground here. Blocks often register as hits. Blatant blocks. They are working on it. They say they're working on it. They told me they're working on it. I haven't seen it. Um, it's a great toy. If I wanted to buy it for, for like Hasbro or something like that, I would never use it for a warp system because it's not reliable. 
because reality is a messy place. The sword can figure out that it's hit something. But was it blocked? Did it actually hit the person? Did I stop it before it hit my neck? A human judge can see this, even in the realm of fencing. No automatic detection system has not been heavily criticized. So much so that systems of Olympic fencing is now officially a different type of sport than historical fencing because the detection system allows you to do things that would never work in a real sport fight because it's based on electrical contact. The contact. <coughs> So because of all these things, they are often accurate, they're frustrating, and most importantly, they constantly require prep and calibration. Sabertron requires calibration. Miles often has to be calibrated on it all the time. This is a very promising product that might be used for a limited thing called LightShot. LightShot is an open source and, uh, Arduino based uh, laser tech system that's being developed in the company in Chicago. They haven't come up with a product yet. It's a single sensor. They use an infrared laser. Just from my personal experience, infrared lasers, the moment you put them in broad daylight, don't work at any range. You can be firing as far as he goes, and it won't go. So let's talk about Planetfall. Planetfall, as I said, was an experiment in getting into a fully augmented system. Um, our two things is that we're going to be relying on mobile apps for the majority of mechanics. We use online technology, something that expand possibilities of character creation. We have a guided character creation. It takes about five seconds to five minutes to do character creation. And we can make it as complicated as we want, put as many steps as we want, and close off as many doors as we want. It is invisible to the player. And invisible to the, when you're invisible to the player, you can make mechanics as complicated as you want and just ask people to make decisions. And also, I don't have to approve characters. If you manage to make the computer do it, it's legal. Save, you save a lot of time as staff if you have a fully automated system. You have economics, is fully automated. You, I do not need ops. I do not need cap. No one can lose their item cards and put them through the wash because they're on the server. So I know exactly what. And most importantly from economic matters, I know exactly how much of everything is in the field. And I know exactly what the mixes are in a campaign. That's very important. I can implement rules changes immediately. I can change the output of something. I can change what something does immediately. And character advancement, I never have to worry about. I never have to approve a spend. I just let the computer do it. This is probably the biggest statement I'm going to make. If you want to talk about immersionism and gameism in an augmented reality game, you're officially in the wrong place. They, have not, they are completely non-exclusive. I have complicated mechanics for science, economy, and production. They're extremely complicated. They're completely diegetic to the game world. All I do is I ask my players to make, to make choices. Because I cheat and use a sci-fi setting, people walking around with little tricorders perfectly in character. I scan something, I get information. And I've had commentary both from the demo game here and in other places that we have people who are very close to system-heavy systems. But they looked at the app and they said, I can make my choice and the computer does it for me. Therefore, I, I've often said, who here wants to use dice rolls to do the World of Warcraft system? You can't. But I just clicked on something and I attacked. And as I said, the big lesson is, if you're doing computers, don't let the computer make decisions because computers are crap at making decisions. But they're really good at executing rules. So what's the catch? Ugh. You will not succeed unless you have dedicated experienced developers, developers from a software background and designers familiar with how technology works. You cannot make technology in addition to your rules. It must be the core of it. If you design rules for a traditional LARP and try to implement it into a, into a technological manner, you will run into problems. Traditional LARP systems avoid things computers are very good at. Computers are good at putting together massive amounts of numbers really quickly, adding one here, subtracting one here, doing this because of that. If I have level five in this skill, I have a 10% better chance. If I have level three in this skill, I have a 10% chance. All that stuff. I can cut up all those factors immediately, display them as a choice to the player, and they hit it, and it works. You would never do this in a traditional large system because no one wants to sit here 
doing a, that scene from Clue. 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1. And make new types of rules. You all, like I said, software development is trench warfare. You're fighting for inches. But once you have that inch, you have it forever. So let's say that I want to make a rule, and I've come up with this entire system, but I say, in this one particular rule, I want to say, if you're an orc, it works slightly different. If you do that in traditional game design, you just write that line, people know whether they're an orc or not, and the rule changes. If you're doing it in a computer thing, that's not what the software engineer hears. The software engineer says that for every single type of action that can occur in the system, I have to check the type of character and have modifiers stored in the system. That is a fundamental change to the engine. But once I've done that, and once I've given that to you as a feature, it means that I can do that everywhere without even thinking about it. But, once again, you write a line in a traditional rule book, I do a fundamental change to the software and add a completely new step in how I assess things. So in order to do this, we have to learn some habits. Um, common traditional rules and LARP become liabilities in an augmented system. Like I said, special case rules, a series to modify something works, especially for a small group of players, have to be avoided or at least seriously justified. And rules that require staff intervention or arbitrary judgments can't even be implemented and undermine the very point of doing offense. So. so my final point is that augmented games, I believe, are, because of these limitations and because of the amount of time you have to spend on them, they are a new genre, not a replacement. But they are definitely part of our hobby's future and will constantly be growing and adapting, and more solutions will come to the fore that are more open source and more teams can Thank you very much.